Hey, so I got a good question uh, messaged to me uh, privately today by uh, someone, a guy um, I, I don't know very well, met a, a couple of times, um, good, good guy, a guy I, I have respect for, I just don't know that well, but, but he asked a, a very good question because it's one that I think a lot of us have asked, I've certainly asked, I think many other Christians have asked it, and the question is, okay, I, I know what the Bible says about uh, homosexuality. Um, however, if if God uh, condemns homosexuality, uh, if this is sin, if this uh, you know sort of behavior um, between two men, particularly two men who are maybe in a committed relationship, uh, two men who are you know quote unquote married, um, if if they're in that long term committed relationship, and uh, you, why does God condemn it, particularly since they were born that way? You know, and, it, and there's kind of two separate questions there. Um, the one about the long term commitment, but the other about, you know, if God condemns it, why are they born that way? And I, I think that's a good question. I've asked, I've wondered that, and, and maybe you have too. So I just want to share a, maybe a couple of my thoughts uh, on that. Um, first of all, maybe it's, uh, it, it's not really getting to the heart of things. Uh, first of all, is just questioning are people born that way uh, or are sexual desires and our sexual inclinations um, something that comes about in early childhood development um, I, I'm not sure that's really even getting to the heart of the question um, certainly studies on identical twins um, that I've come across makes me think that uh, just within early child development these sort of sexual differences happen uh, so I'm not sure we're necessarily born that way. However, that, I don't think that's really the point or the heart of what the guy is getting at. Um, the question is whether it we're born with that or whether those sexual, um, if you, for lack of a better word, orientations, that seems to be the current popular word, but the, these sexual inclinations they develop at a, a young age, uh, certainly out of our control. We don't uh, control the development of these desires. Why, if God condemns it as sin, why is it that certainly early on in life, these inclinations, these desires, these orientations, and particularly in, in this, you know, the question of homosexuality, why, uh, you know, why is it people are born that way or develop that very early? It's for me, when, when I ask that, I, it, it, I just have to ask a bigger question. Why, why is it that um, any sin is so natural? Why, why is it that sin generally? Why, why are we, if God condemns sin, all, all sin, why is it that we are born sinners? Uh, if God condemns lying and disobedience to parents and all this, why is it, why are we born that way? Why is it so natural? Why is it that it's it's like breathing? We don't even think about it. We we covet and we complain. Uh, if you want to just focus on sexual sin, why is it not just homosexuality? Why does all sexual sin, why does so much sexual sin, so much heterosexual sin seem to come so naturally? You know, what, why is it, uh, you know, as a, as a heterosexual man, as a, as a man attracted to women, why is it that it is a struggle? Sometimes and I have a wonderful wife, she's a delightful wife, we have a good marriage and all. But why is it temptation can so easily come? Why do I need to guard myself? Why do I have other men in my life to make sure I'm being faithful to my wife? Uh, and all these things. It's because sin comes in. It's because you can all of a sudden find desires. Sometimes on a, more often than certainly I'd like to admit on a YouTube video of, of, of looking at women in ways I should not or thinking about women in ways that are sinful or, uh, you know, why is that? Why is it that so many men throughout the ages, you know, married men end up taking mistresses? Why is it that adultery happens, fornication happens? Why, why are people, if God just wanted sex for marriage, why is it so natural to begin sleeping together before you're married? All these things. Well, why is all sexual sin so natural? For some people, of course, there, there's other types of sin. You know, there's, uh, you know, I, I've, in my pastoral experience, I've only known one guy so far, but, you know, one guy who um, had, uh, was physically attracted to prepubescent children, uh, children before, who haven't developed, haven't hit puberty yet. And yet from the time he was a teenager onward, that's, he could not have any sexual thoughts or inclinations for anything but prepubescent. It was, it was the most natural thing for him. And that's, 
what it is for for many uh, pedophiles. They they would get rid of those desires if they could, and yet they can't. Their whole life they've known nothing but those desires. Um, obviously, those are criminal and dangerous, and I'm not trying to compare those to necessarily heterosexual adultery or homosexuality. They're they're unique and different in many ways. And yet, why is it so natural to them? They don't have to try to be that way. They just are that way, just like for some of us, lying or complaining might be. Why why is sin so natural? And so the question, getting back, you know, if um, you know if the Bible condemns homosexual, why are people born homosexual? Well, if the Bible condemns sin, why are people born sinners? And why is it so natural to us? Um, for me, it just brings back the absolute tragedy of what the, what Christians for you know a long time have sometimes called the fall. Uh, whether you think that's the best term for it or not, it's kind of irrelevant right now. But it's the idea that we are a race, the human race is separated from God, that we are under the power and dominion of sin and of Satan, um, that sin has tainted every single aspect of who we are. There's not a single part of our humanity that has not in some way been tainted by sin. That touch is total. That does not mean we are as bad as we could be. It's kind of like... um. Uh, a bucket of water. You know, if you have a, a glass pitcher of water, you can see the water, you can see kind of right through it. And if you were to come and drop, you know, put a drop of ink into it, that drop of ink would go down to the water and disseminate. And and pretty soon, the, in just a matter of seconds, really, the whole, all the water would be tainted, you know, and it wouldn't be clear. You couldn't see right through the, the glass. I mean, you could still see through it, but it, it would be tainted there. And so all of the water is tainted. We are all tainted by sin, all of us. Now, we're not as bad as we could be. You could add more drops. You could continue down a pathway of sin. You can get worse and worse and worse. And yet, no matter how, um, no matter how good we might be, no matter how pure we might be, every part of us has still been touched by sin. So we're just a, we're a race of humanity that's in desperate need of salvation and redemption. And even as Christians who are putting our faith in Jesus, we've experienced forgiveness, we've experienced change, and yet we still have sinful desires. Some of them are sexual, some of them are, are heterosexual desires, some of them are homosexual desires, maybe some other type of sexual desires outside of just those two. Um, and we have sinful desires. And desire are things that we, we should not. Um, it it just goes to show how lost we are and how desperate we are in need of a savior. How desperately all of us, whatever our desires, whether it be heterosexual desires that are sinful or homosexual desires, it it shows us that we need Christ. Another part that that's one thing. My other thought is just this: um, it, these questions are really hard about like what's allowed and what's not allowed uh, if you don't know the purpose of sex. Uh, why did God create sex? Like he could have created another way for human beings to reproduce children. He didn't. Why did God make two genders? Why didn't he just make one gender? Why didn't he make us like those worms that are unisex but can still reproduce? Like there are certain organisms that can do that. They don't need a male and female. Why did, why did God create two genders and create uh, sexual uh, expression to be the way of, of reproducing life? Well, for, for the Christian view, and in because without that, without answering that question, without seeing the purpose of sex, the design of sex, the beauty of sex, a lot of these rules just seem arbitrary. You know, why can't I take a mistress? Uh, why, why is it wrong for me to look at porn? Uh, why can't I sleep with a man just like I sleep with a woman? Why can't, why can't I fulfill any uh, desire or orientation or uh, longing or preference uh, that I have? Well, if sex has a purpose that this is supposed to be what it looks like, this is what I'm supposed to use my sexuality for, and we have a vision of the, the meaning, the purpose behind that, then all of a sudden denying myself uh, all these other inclinations that I might have. And living for that, it's because it has a higher purpose, not just some arbitrary rule. You're allowed to do this, but not this. Well, why? Well, because God said so. Well, well, yes, because God said so. We need to be obedient even when we don't understand what he's asking us to. But he has given us revelation that the male and the female were created in such a way, and the relationship between the male and the female in covenant is a picture to all of humanity of what uh, God's purpose for human history is, what his purpose is for the church, the family, the, the, the male, female, family producing children. is a, It's a picture of the end of the world. It's a picture of where God is taking humanity. It says it's of God laying down his life in Christ for his bride, for her respecting and honoring her husband. The, the word of God enters history and brings life to 
the bride, like just like the man enters the woman and releases his seed and it brings life. So the word of God comes into us and transforms us and brings, uh, makes us pregnant with life, so to speak. And it, sex is such a sacramental, um, symbolic act of the way uh, Christians and Orthodox Jews un understand, it, more so Christians, but Orthodox Jews to a point, but even more so Christians understand how God is dealing with human history and where he is taking it. If you have a vision of that, you understand sex isn't just about romantic feelings or feeling warm or close to someone or just some w wild excitement. Um, it's not about, first and foremost, the romance, though there is some of that. It's not the uh, wild, exciting orgy sort of thing, though, yes, yeah, sex can be you know wildly exciting at times. But it, it's not about either of those. It's not about just feeling close to someone. Um, it, it, it's about using our, our body to to be a sacrament, a symbol uh, of what God is doing in the world and where he's taking things. And, and if you have a vision for that uh, and of the beauty of God's design for sexuality, you, um, you will understand why you need to deny yourself the pornography or the mistress or the girlfriend on the side or the, the adultery or the fornication or the homosexuality or a whole long list of other things. Um, because we're trying to paint this. Therefore, everything else that is not helping to paint this, uh, we should try to avoid, particularly as Christians who understand God's uh, plan and purpose for sexuality in general. Okay, so those are just a couple of thoughts. I, I hope I could um, at least give a partial answer um, to this question that this guy had, and, and I know that many other Christians have.